The role of ultrasound in the first trimester includes confirmation of an intrauterine pregnancy, assessment of fetal viability and fetal number. This is also the most accurate time to assign gestational age. It's always important not only to evaluate the pregnancy, but to evaluate the uterus and ovaries for any abnormalities, such as fibroids or adnexal masses, which may impact on the pregnancy. Clinical indications for ultrasound assessment in first trimester pregnancy include evaluation of pelvic pain, a palpable mass, and vaginal bleeding. There are many causes of vaginal bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy. It could be considered normal, many times occurring at the time of implantation, but of course we're going to worry about other causes, such as a threatened or completed abortion, embryonic demise, blighted ovum, subchorionic hematoma, ectopic pregnancy, and molar pregnancy. In recent years, sonography in the first trimester has also played a more important role in the evaluation of chromosomal and fetal structural abnormalities, but I will not be addressing these applications in this lecture. What I would like to do now is review the normal ultrasound milestones in first trimester of pregnancy. And I'm going to be describing these findings at transvaginal sonography because this is really what we're going to be utilizing in the first trimester. The first structure that we will see in normal pregnancy is the gestational sac, also referred to as the chorionic sac. And this will usually be seen transvaginally at a gestational, a gestational age of four and a half to five weeks. Once it is visualized, it will grow on average a millimeter per day. And once we visualize the gestational sac, we can use this to assign gestational age by calculating the mean sac diameter. And to do that, you just take the size of the sac in three orthogonal planes, add them up, and divide by three. The next structure that we will see contained within the gestational sac is the yolk sac. And once we see the yolk sac, this indicates that the gestational age will be roughly five to five and a half weeks. And it's very important once we visualize the yolk sac because its presence confirms that the fluid structure that we're visualizing within the uterus is in fact a true gestational sac related to an intrauterine pregnancy and not a pseudo sac, for instance, that we might see in an ectopic gestation. The normal yolk sac should be less than six millimeters in size. It should be, should be circular and thin-walled and round in contour. And we may visualize this until the end of the first trimester. The next structure that we will see within the gestational sac is the embryo, or fetal pole, as we see here. And with transvaginal scanning now, we may be able to see the embryo before we can actually visualize fetal cardiac activity. And this usually corresponds to a gestational age of five and a half to six weeks. Once we visualize the fetal pole, we can calculate a crown rump length and use this to assign gestational age. And this is the most accurate time to assign a gestational age. One important uh, threshold measurement that you need to remember is that at a crown rump length of five millimeters in a normal pregnancy, we should expect to see a fetal heart rate, a heartbeat. If we do not see this, for instance, if the crown rump length measures eight, nine, or 10 millimeters, then we have to worry that this is a non-viable pregnancy. I'd like to review now the first trimester transvaginal ultrasound milestones and put them in the context of the quantitative beta HCG level. And I'm giving you these measurements uh, in the second international standard. And you have to know what standard for measurement is used in your particular laboratory at your hospital. So if you see only a gestational sac, and you don't yet see a yolk sac or fetal cardiac activity, that will correspond to a gestational age of approximately four and a half to five weeks. And here the quantitative beta HCG level will generally be in the range of 500 to 1,000. If you see a gestational sac and a yolk sac, but do not yet see fetal cardiac activity, this indicates a gestational age of approximately five to five and a half weeks, and the beta level is usually greater than 3,600. If you see all three findings, this usually indicates a gestational age of five and a half to six weeks, and the beta is generally greater than 5,400.
Now, once you see a fluid collection or cystic structure within the uterus, are there some findings that you can use to confirm that what you're looking at is, in fact, a true gestational sac and not a pseudo sac? And I already mentioned that if you see a yolk sac, um, that is sort of the best evidence um, when we don't yet see a fetal pole that this is, in fact, a true gestational sac. However, there are two signs that are described in the literature that can help you conclude that what you're looking at is likely a gestational sac, and these include the double decidual sign and the intradecidual sign. The double decidual sign was described many years ago, and it actually was a finding at transabdominal sonography. And what this refers to is that you see two concentric hyperechoic rings surrounding the gestational sac. And this corresponds to the two layers of the decidua, the decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis. And it was shown that when you see this appearance, it correlates very highly with the presence of an IUP. The problem is, is now that this is felt to be a less useful sign now that we have transvaginal scanning, which allows for higher resolution, and you can actually um, see a yolk sac at the time when you would be able to see this sign. So it's not as helpful uh, earlier on in gestation, um, and we tend not to rely on it uh, as much now that we have transvaginal scanning. The other sign that's been described is the intradecidual sign, and this is an earlier sign that we see, and it can be visualized before the double decidual sign. And this refers to the presence of a well-defined round or oval fluid collection located eccentrically within the the decidua, which demonstrates an echogenic rim. It is adjacent to but does not deform the central cavity echo complex. And we can see this now if we utilize the high frequency transvaginal probe. Well, how reliable is this sign? Uh, in terms of predicting an intrauterine pregnancy. And Dr. Lang and her colleagues in 1997 looked at this question and actually found that the overall accuracy of this sign for predicting an IUP was only 45 percent. So their conclusion was that you cannot use this sign to reliably distinguish an early IUP from a pseudo-gestational sac. And although if you see it, you can uh, say in your report that it may correspond to a very early gestational sac, you certainly should recommend a follow-up scan. Now, I just want to say uh, a few words about uh, multiple gestations, because in the first trimester, this really is the best time to decide what type of multiple gestation you're dealing with. And I'm just going to talk about twins here for a moment. So with dichorionic, diamnionic twins, what we're going to see early in the first trimester is that there will be two chorionic sacs or gestational sacs present within the uterus. And here we see two sacs. One is slightly smaller than the other, and we see the two yolk sacs contained within. Now, later on, as the pregnancy progresses, this is going to appear as only one sac. You will be able to see an intertwin membrane, um, which generally will be thicker in a dichorionic diamniotic twin gestation compared to a monochorionic diamniotic twin gestation. And you will oftentimes see this peak here, the so-called lambda sign or twin peak sign, which helps you to conclude that it's a dichorionic diamniotic twin gestation. But you don't always see these findings, and it gets more difficult to make this uh, distinction later on in pregnancy. Now, on the other hand, with a monochorionic diamniotic twin gestation, we're going to see only one chorionic sac, as we see here. And then within it, if we look carefully, we can see that there are two, in fact, uh, two separate amniotic sacs and two yolk sacs, in addition to our two embryos here, confirming that this is a monodi pregnancy. Now, sometimes very early on with a monochorionic diamniotic twin gestation, it's very difficult to see the amniotic sacs because the amniotic membrane is very thin. So here we see one chorionic sac, and we see there are two fetal poles here, and there are two yolk sacs. Now, even though we don't see a uh, amniotic membrane here and two separate amniotic sacs, we can conclude that this is, is likely a monochorionic diamniotic twin gestation because we see two yolk sacs. And the presence of two yolk sacs does correlate with the presence of a monochorionic diamniotic twin gestation. So that's a clue that you can use to help you if you're not sure.
So here uh, is an example of a monochorionic monoamniotic twin gestation where we see one chorionic sac, we see two fetal poles here, here, and here, but we see only one yolk sac. So again, consistent with a mono-mono twin pregnancy. Okay, now having reviewed some of the uh, findings in a normal first trimester of pregnancy, I'd like to review some of the findings that we may see at sonography when there's failure of an early pregnancy or actually a non-viable pregnancy. Up to 31% of early pregnancies will fail. Vaginal bleeding occurs in 25% of known first trimester pregnancies, and of these, about half will be lost. An ultrasound can be very helpful to predict which pregnancies are viable and which are, have failed or are failing. And I'd like to uh, review this uh, list with you. So what are some findings associated with poor outcome? Well, as I've already mentioned, if you do not see fetal cardiac activity and the crown rump length is greater than five millimeters, or if you have a reliable gestational age of six to six and a half weeks, then that's going to be a very worrisome finding. If you have a mean sac diameter greater than eight millimeters with no yolk sac and greater than 16 millimeters and no fetal pole, those are worrisome findings. If you have a quantitative beta HCG level, which is greater than 1,000, and you do not see an intrauterine gestational sac, and here the chief differential consideration is going to include an ectopic gestation, and that's what we're going to have to be most worried about. If there's fetal bradycardia with a fetal heart rate of less than 85 beats per minute. If you see a gestational sac but it's abnormal, it may be abnormal because it's too small. And what's too small? Well, usually you can just eyeball it and see that the uh, sac is too small uh, with respect to the size of the embryo. But there is actually a formula you can use, and that is if you take the mean sac diameter and subtract the crown rump length and get a value that's less than five millimeters, that's considered a small sac, and that has been associated with a poor outcome. <clears throat> The sac may also be abnormal if it's irregular in shape or if it's abnormally located, if it's located too low within the uterus or if it's uh, located outside of the uterus. You may see a yolk sac, but it may be abnormal. It can be abnormal if it's too large, if it's greater than six millimeters, if it's calcified, or if it's irregular in shape. If you see an amniotic sac and don't see anything in it, no yolk sac, no fetal pole. That's called an empty amniotic sac sign, and that's also a worrisome finding. Lastly, you may see a subchorionic hematoma. And we're going to go through some examples here. So here's an intrauterine gestational sac. Uh, we see the sac within the uterus, but we don't see anything else in it. We don't see a yolk sac. We don't see a fetal pole. This sac size is such that we should be able to see both of those, and we don't. This was basically an empty gestational sac corresponding to a blighted ovum. Here's an example of a small gestational sac. So we have the gestational sac, and then we see the embryo within it. And again, I don't really think you need to use that formula here. You can see that there just doesn't seem to be enough fluid surrounding that embryo. But if you do the math, you would see that the crown rump length is more or less equivalent to the mean sac diameter here, and you would get a value of zero. And Dr. Bromley and her colleagues in 91 published a paper where they found that this finding was associated or predictive of miscarriage in 94 four percent of cases. Now here we are back at our dichorionic diamniotic twin gestation again, and I like to show this because it shows you a normal yolk sac uh, juxtaposed next to an abnormal yolk sac. And you can see that this yolk sac is abnormal because it's too large it's, and it's greater than six millimeters if you actually measure it. The other finding, as I alluded to earlier, is that this chorionic sac is actually smaller than this one. And what happened here was that this went on to develop a normal pregnancy, but this went on to a blighted twin uh, and did not develop. Now, there have been uh, some papers that have looked at uh, how reliable are these first trimester ultrasound parameters of failed pregnancy. And Rowling and colleagues in radiology in 97 uh, published this paper where they described 30 patients with a normal pregnancy outcome despite non-visualization of a yolk sac up to 19 millimeters. And they said that rather than using that value of 8 millimeters, we should use a mean sac diameter of 20 millimeters and no yolk sac to achieve a 100% specificity for a failed pregnancy. 
Also in their series, they had five patients without an embryo at a mean sac diameter of 19 millimeters. Remember I had said we uh, generally use 16 millimeters as our cutoff, who then later on developed an embryo and had a normal pregnancy outcome at follow-up. They also, in their series, had uh, patients who uh, fulfilled this cat uh, criterion for a small sac size, and they call this first trimester oligohydramnios because basically the sac is too small and there's not enough fluid. And they found in that subpopulation of patients there was an overall survival rate of 35 percent. So their conclusion from their work was that these established parameters serve as a guideline only. And I think that, that we should always consider each pregnancy individually and be conservative. If it's a desired pregnancy and we have findings that are somewhat borderline, we should certainly give the pregnancy the benefit of the doubt and recommend serial ultrasound follow-up as well as correlation with quantitative beta HCG levels. Just a few words about embryonic heart rate. The heart rate will increase between six and nine weeks gestation. At six weeks, the mean heart rate is in the range of 90 to 133 beats per minute. At nine weeks gestation, the mean heart rate is in the range of 144 to 170 beats per minute. And it has been shown that if you have a fetal heart rate of less than 80 before six and a half weeks or so, or below 100 at six and a half to seven weeks, then those pregnancies have loss rates approaching 100%. So again, if you're scanning a patient and she's just at about five and a half to six weeks, six and a half weeks, and you see fetal cardiac activity, but the rate is slow in the 80 to 90 range, let's say, you certainly want to give the pregnancy the benefit of the doubt, but you do have to be somewhat cautious and recommend that the patient come back for close ultrasound follow-up and to reconfirm fetal viability. A subchorionic hematoma is the most common source of bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy. This represents a marginal abruption with separation of the chorion from the endometrial lining. And the outcome will be dependent upon the size of the hematoma, the gest gestational age at which the hematoma occurs, and maternal age. And generally, serial scans to monitor are recommended. A subchorionic hematoma will appear as a crescentic in shape, complex fluid collection located next to the gestational sac, which has homogeneous low-level echoes um, consistent with blood. And you can attempt to quantify the size of the hematoma by describing how much of the hematoma or how much of the gestational sac, rather, is in continuity with the hematoma. If it's less than one-third, this would be considered a small hematoma, as we see here. If it's between one-third to two-thirds, then we would call that moderate. And if it's greater than two-thirds, it would be considered a large hematoma. So this is a relatively small hematoma. This patient came back for follow-up, and the pregnancy progressed normally, and she had a normal pregnancy outcome. On the other hand, I think you can appreciate here that this is a very large hematoma. It basically has undermined the entire circumference of the gestational sac, and this patient came back a couple of days later with a completed spontaneous abortion. When I was a fellow working with Dr. Beryl Banasaraf, we looked into the question of how does a subchorionic hematoma impact on pregnancy outcome and published our work in radiology. And these numbers here indicate spontaneous abortion rates. And what we did was we looked at about 520 patients who presented in the first trimester of pregnancy and on transvaginal sonography were found to have a subchorionic hematoma. We stratified patients by maternal age, either less than 35 or greater than equal to 35, and also by the gestational age at the time of presentation with the bleed. And we broke it down into two categories, if the pregnancy was less than or equal to eight weeks gestational age or greater than eight weeks gestational age. And then we uh, categorized the hematomas using the size criterion as I just described to you. And basically what we found was that in all categories, the older women tended to have higher spontaneous abortion rates, but this is likely multifactorial. But within each age category, you can see that the earlier the patient presented with the bleed, if she was less than eight weeks, this was associated with higher pregnancy loss rates compared to if she presented later with the bleed. Likewise, you can see, and it kind of makes sense, that as the size of the bleed increased, there was also an increase in the spontaneous abortion rates. So I think that you can use this data to help counsel patients in terms of what the likely outcome will be and also to help the clinicians decide how closely you should follow these pregnancies.
Molar pregnancies occur with an incidence in 1 in 1,200 to 2,000 pregnancies. 80 percent will follow a benign course, up to 15 percent will go on to invasive mole, and 5 to 8 percent metastatic choriocarcinoma. The most common type of molar pregnancy is the complete mole, and here the chromosomal makeup is 46XX, and all chromosomes are derived paternally. There is an absence of fetal tissue, and there is trophoblastic proliferation and uh, hydrobic degeneration of the chorionic villi, which causes this very typical or characteristic ultrasound appearance of an echogenic soft tissue mass filling and distending the uterine cavity with multiple associated cystic spaces. Now, uh, many times if we're considering a molar gestation, we look for the presence of thecoluteum cysts and use this to either support or um, sort of uh, go against our, our thinking that this may be a molar pregnancy, but it's been reported in the literature that actually you will see thecoluteum cysts in only 20 to 50 percent of molar gestation. So if you don't see multiple thecoluteum cysts, it doesn't help you. Here's an example of a complete mole and what it looks like at transabdominal sonography and transvaginal sonography. And we see here that the endometrial cavity is distended and filled with this echogenic mass which has multiple small cystic spaces within it. And this has been referred to as the so-called snowstorm or cluster of grapes appearance. Here's another example of a complete mole transabdominally and then transvaginally where we see the same findings. There's no fetal tissue here. Now a partial mole is much less common. And here uh, in this situation, a fetus is present, although it will have multiple congenital anomalies. And the chromosomal makeup is that of triploidy, which is XXY, where there are two paternal and one set of maternal chromosomes. And one of the characteristic features of a triploid fetus is when you see early onset intrauterine growth restriction. And there also tend to be multiple other congenital anomalies. So in addition to an abnormal fetus, we're going to see the characteristic uh, changes in the placenta, including enlargement and thickening of the placenta, and numerous cystic spaces that we would see in a molar pregnancy. So here's an example of a partial mole, and you can see this abnormal placenta here, which is enlarged and thickened. It has these multiple cystic areas within it. There was a fetus, in fact, present. You can see that there was an evidence for a, a neural tube defect down here in the area of the sacrum, and this fetus was severely growth restricted. and at chromosomal analysis, this was confirmed as a triploid fetus associated with a partial molar gestation. Now, there is a differential diagnosis that you may want to consider when you encounter a complex intrauterine mass in a pregnant patient. And uh, we're, of course, going to think about the possibility of a molar pregnancy. And uh, many times we will get the uh, clinical um, history that goes along with a mole in that the patient complains of hyperemesis and then a quantitative beta HCG level is drawn and is found to be very, very high. Um, however, um, you can also see similar findings if you have a fetal demise with retained pla placental tissue which has undergone hydropic degeneration or if you have retained blood clots. And sometimes it can be difficult to make this distinction and they can look very similar. So again, you're going to suggest that they clinically correlate and certainly correlate with the quantitative beta HCG levels. Now in rare circumstances, you can also consider the possibility of pre-existing endometrial pathology such as a large degenerating submucosal leiomyoma or endometrial polyp. Now here's an example of a patient who presents with vaginal bleeding. And we see that there is an intrauterine pregnancy. We see an embryo here. And then we see a placenta, which looks very abnormal. It's very thickened. It has multiple cystic areas within it. And um, if we weren't given any clinical history here, we could think about the possibility of a partial molar gestation. However, the uh, beta levels were trending downward. And this patient ultimately underwent a DNC. And this was just a failed pregnancy with hydropic degeneration of the placenta. Now, many times, if a patient does come in in the setting of bleeding and a failed first trimester pregnancy, we're asked to evaluate for the presence of retained products of conception. Now, in later gestation, this is associated, uh, there's an increased incidence associated when you have an accessory placental lobe or if you have placental implantation abnormalities, such as placenta accreta or increta. 
In the first trimester, what we're going to see is that we're going to see a focal uh, solid appearing hyperechoic mass within the endometrial cavity. And the problem is, is that um, the other differential we have to think about here, if the patient has been bleeding, is could this be retained blood clot? And the way to make that distinction is to use color and spectral Doppler. And when we interrogate this abnormality with Doppler, we see that it is quite vascular. It demonstrates a typical trophoblastic waveform in that there is high diastolic flow and low resistive index. So we can tell the clinician that there is retained products here and the patient needs to undergo DNC. <clears throat> For the second part of the lecture, I would like to focus the discussion on ectopic pregnancy. This occurs with an incidence of 20, to 1, 000, 20 out of 1,000 pregnancies, and it is responsible for 9% of all pregnancy-related deaths. So this is a diagnosis that we certainly do not want to miss. It occurs with increased incidence in women who have um, some form of tubal injury, whether it's related to pelvic inflammatory disease, a prior ectopic pre pregnancy, or tubal surgery. It also occurs with increased uh, incidence in patients who have been exposed to DES in older patients and also patients who have an intrauterine device in place. The classic clinical triad of pain, vaginal bleeding, and an adnexal mass is actually present in less than half of patients who ultimately are shown to have an ectopic pregnancy. So this can present a diagnostic challenge to the clinician. Now, in terms of the location of ectopic pregnancies, I'm showing you a diagram from Kalen's textbook on ultrasonography and obstetrics and gynecology, and it shows you all of the different locations where ectopic pregnancies can occur. Most of them, 95 to 97 percent, will occur in the ampullary or ismic portion of the tube. A smaller percentage, 2 to 5 percent, will occur in the interstitial portion of the tube or the cornua of the uterus, the so-called cornual uh, ectopic. Less than 1 percent will implant in the region of the uterine cervix, as we see here. And also a small percentage can actually be intra-ovarian in location, and it's very rare to have an abdominal ectopic pregnancy, but it can occur. Now, as I mentioned, the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy can be a challenge uh, clinically. And we can attempt to uh, make the diagnosis. Um, and one of the pieces informa of information that we might use is to look at hormone levels. Now, it is said that in a normal pregnancy, <clears throat> quantitative beta HCG levels should double every 48 hours. Okay, maybe I'll take a break there. <laughs> okay. Just start on the top of that slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> It gets so dry with all of this. Okay. Just give it a second here. <clears throat> I think we're good. We're good again? Okay. Now, as I mentioned, the uh, diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy can present a challenge to the clinician. One piece of data that we can look at is that of hormone levels. And in a normal pregnancy, uh, beta HCG levels should double approximately every 48 hours. Uh, and it is said that in ectopic pregnancies, there will actually be a slower elevation or rise of the beta HCG level. However, up to 15 percent of normal pregnancies may be associated with an abnormal doubling time, and likewise, 17 percent of ectopic pregnancies can have normal doubling times, so this won't always help you. You can also look at progesterone levels. If you have a low progesterone level, this has a very high positive predictive value for the presence of a non-viable pregnancy, but it doesn't differentiate from a non-viable intrauterine versus extrauterine gestation. And so ultrasound is really key in the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy and plays a very important role. What is my approach to the ultrasound diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy? I always begin with a transabdominal assessment. And I do this because this allows for a global view of the pelvis and uh, allows me to quantitate the amount of fluid that might be present. And I always look up in the flanks, 
in the, in the paracolic gutters. I don't have the patient fill her bladder for this. I just have the uh, clinician send the patient up directly from the emergency room and just take a look transabdominally. And this is also very helpful because uh, if you remember, a transvaginal probe um, has a higher uh, frequency and therefore a higher resolution compared to a transabdominal probe, but also um, results in a smaller, more limited field of view. So you can actually miss things um, such as, although rare, uh, the abdominal ectopic if you only perform a transvaginal scan. Now, pretty much in each circumstance, we're going to proceed from a transabdominal scan to a transvaginal scan, and that's because this allows for better resolution, and you can uh, identify smaller structures, such as an early gestational sac, earlier, and you can also better characterize an agnexal mass and pelvic fluid. Uh, the reported sensitivity of transvaginal sonography for an ectopic pregnancy at the time of the initial exam ranges from 73 to 96 percent. Now, sometimes uh, we consider, well, if the patient's quantitative beta HCG level is below that threshold level of 1,000, when I would expect to see a normal intrauterine pregnancy, am I going to see anything if I do an ultrasound, for instance, in a patient who has a, a beta of only 200 or 300? And it turns out, as this study showed, that even the, when the beta is low and below this threshold value of 1,000, you can still see findings that are very suggestive for the presence of an ectopic, and that is because you have to remember that an ectopic pregnancy is not a normal pregnancy, and we wouldn't expect to see the same elevation in the quantitative beta HCG levels in an ectopic that we see in a normal pregnancy. And in, in this paper, they found findings such as a complex agnexal mass, a large amount of free fluid, or an extra uterine gestational sac with a yolk sac and free fluid, or fetal pole with fetal cardiac activity. So even if the beta is low, it is still worth performing an ultrasound if there's a clinical suspicion for for an ectopic gestation. Well, this table summarizes what the probability of an ectopic pregnancy is when you have various scan findings at transvaginal sonography, and this uh, is with respect to the findings that you would see in the adnexa, and this is work that comes from Dr. Dubelay and his colleagues at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And if you have a normal scan or a simple unilocular cyst, but you do not see an intrauterine pregnancy, the probability of an ectopic is low, but it's not zero, it's 5%. So again, this is a type of patient you'd probably want to follow closely. If you see a complex adnexal mass, and in the setting of an ectopic pregnancy, this usually corresponds to a hematoma or blood clot in the adnexa, that corresponded to a probability of ectopic of 92 percent. If you see a tubal ring, uh, this is associated with a probability of 95 percent. And what is a tubal ring? Well, that is when you have a tubal ectopic, and there is proliferation of trophoblastic tissue within the fallopian tube. If you cut across that in cross-section, it has a ring-like appearance, and that is the tubal ring. Um, of course, if you see a live embryo or yolk sac <clears throat> outside of the uterus, that's going to be 100 percent probability of an ectopic. Now, if you see an intrauterine pregnancy, for all intents and purposes, that's going to exclude the possibility of an ectopic gestation. However, it is not um, – you can, in very rare circumstances, have a so-called heterotopic gestation where you have a coexisting intra- and extrauterine pregnancy. It's rare, but it does occur, and I'll show you an example of that. So here, for some examples of ectopic pregnancies, here we have an extrauterine gestational sac here in the left adnexa. You can see that it is sitting next to the left ovary. We see a fetal pole here. There's a yolk sac. Clearly, this is an ectopic pregnancy. Here's another pregnancy where we see a gestational sac, which is outside of the uterus uh, in the adnexa. And here we actually have two uh, fetal poles, and this was an ectopic twin gestation. Here's a patient who presents for rule out ectopic, and on the transabdominal scan, we just see this large, sort of solid appearing heterogeneous mass. In the adnexa, if you look a little bit more closely, you see this hyperechoic ring like structure. 
Um, we take a look up above and we see that there's a moderate amount of free fluid here with fluid in Morrison's pouch. And then to get a better uh, look at this adnexal mass, we're going to proceed to a transvaginal scan. And when we do that, we can actually now visualize uh, a gestational sac which contains not only a yolk sac but also a small fetal pole which demonstrated fetal cardiac activity on M mode scanning, so this was a live uh, ectopic gestation. Here we have another uh, patient. We see these findings in the adnexa. Uh, there was no IUP. Here's the ovary. It has a corpus luteum cyst in it. And then we see this structure here separate from the ovary. We can appreciate a gestational sac here and a yolk sac. Um, and here we have complex free fluid in the pelvis with low-level echoes uh, compatible with blood. And here's another example, two patients where we can see a tubal ring, where we see this hyperechoic ring-like structure sitting next to the ovary here uh, out in the adnexa. And sometimes um, it's hard to see a tubal ring, but if you look for it carefully, you may be able to see it. So here's a patient who uh, presents for rural ectopic. We have transvaginal uh, scan, and we see that there is no intrauterine pregnancy. Uh, we saw an ovary here, which looked pretty normal. But then also in the adnexa on the side where she was having pain, we saw what looked like echogenic material and a large blood clot. Uh, we used our transvaginal probe to interrogate that further, and we do see, in fact, there there is a very small tubal ring here sort of located within the hematoma. Here's an example of a patient with a blood-filled fallopian tube, which is another ultrasound finding of an ectopic, a hematosalpinx. And once again, if we look carefully, uh, we can see the presence of the tubal ring. And then other times we'll just see a complex adnexal mass um, corresponding to a hematoma, um, and we see that there's complex free fluid in the cul-de-sac of the pelvis. Uh, there's no intrauterine pregnancy here, and so again, this is an ectopic pregnancy until proven otherwise. Now, as I mentioned, a heterotopic pregnancy refers to the simultaneous intra- and extrauterine uh, gestations. This is more common after assisted reproduction and can occur with an incidence of 1 in 4,000 to 1 in 7,000. And so if you're um, evaluating a patient with this history, you have to have a high level of suspicion. And even if you see an intrauterine pregnancy, you have to carefully search the adnexa and make sure that there is not a coexisting ectopic. And here Here's uh, an example of this. So in this patient, we have a early intrauterine pregnancy. We see the gestational sac and the yolk sac within it. But then when we look out in the uh, left at Nexa, we see another gestational sac with a yolk sac. And this patient's ovaries are enlarged and have multiple cysts because they were hyperstimulated. Now, um, those are the findings that you might see within the adnexa. We can also talk about findings within the uterus. I've already described for you the double decidual and intradecidual signs. Uh, and this uh, is, in contrast, an example of a pseudosac. And a pseudosac is a collection of fluid and blood within the endometrial cavity that you can see in up to 10% of ectopic gestations. And this occurs because uh, there's retrograde bleeding um, from the fallopian tube with blood accumulating in the endometrial canal. And notice how unlike the case of the double decidual sign or the intradecidual sign, this fluid collection is complex, it's irregular, and it's located centrally within the uh, endometrial uh, canal and is surrounded by the decidualized endometrium. Now, uh, it was felt at one time that you might be able to look at the thickness of the endometrial stripe and use that to predict whether or not an ectopic pregnancy is present. Uh, but it turns out that this probably is not so helpful, and Maida and colleagues in 1999 in a uh, published series found that there was no significant difference in endometrial thickness between women with an ectopic and those who had had a spontaneous pregnancy loss. Also, there was a lot of overlap with uh, patients with a normal IUP. So the conclusion conclusion was that there really is no threshold for endometrial thickness that helps you distinguish between an ectopic, a pregnancy loss, or a viable IUP.
Now, you can use, in addition to grayscale findings, uh, color and spectral Doppler findings to help you make the diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy. And there have been papers addressing the use of Doppler to look for arterial flow in the endometrium, to evaluate tubal blood flow, and also to evaluate the flow in an adnexal mass. And Pellerito and his colleagues showed that in an ectopic pregnancy, the resistive index uh, is typically low, less than 0.3 to uh, 0.4, and that's because, again, this is a uh, low-resistance uh, trophoblastic-type waveform that you would expect to see with an ectopic pregnancy. However, the problem with this is that there's a lot of overlap with the spectral Doppler findings in a corpus luteum, which is a normal structure in pregnancy. So I think most people would agree that the grayscale findings are still most important. I think color can help you if you are looking at, as in some of the examples that I showed you, of a large blood clot in the adnexa, you can certainly put on your color Doppler and see if maybe you can identify a tubal ring uh, because of the increased associated vascularity that you otherwise would not appreciate. And here's an example of this. So this is a patient with an ectopic in the left adnexa. She happened to have a dermoid cyst in her left ovary. And then sitting next to that, we see uh, this tubal ring, and if we put on our color Doppler, we show that it's very hypervascular, and then the spectral tracing uh, demonstrates a resistive index of 0.31, again, with a low resistance, high diastolic type waveform. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's always important to look for free fluid. Um, when you're assessing for the presence of an ectopic pregnancy, you want to quantitate it in terms of how much of it there is, and also you want to look at it, and is it complex or is it simple? And Nyberg showed that if you see debris in fluid um, corresponding to blood, that correlates very highly with the presence of an ectopic pregnancy and actually can be the only finding that you'll see in up to 15% of uh, ectopic gestations. And other uh, investigators have also uh, uh, sort of confirmed this. And so whenever you see hemoperitoneum, you have to raise your level of suspicion for the presence of an ectopic, even if you don't see the ectopic gestation itself. Now, there is a differential that you can consider um, that would include a spontaneous abortion with anagrade flow of blood uh, from the fallopian tubes into the peritoneal cavity, or occasionally you can have rupture of a hemorrhagic corpus luteum cyst. But your, your leading consideration has to be that of an ectopic pregnancy. Now, I'd like to just show you some examples of some of the more unusual locations where you may find an ectopic gestation. Um, the cervix, um, this typically clinically will present as an incomplete abortion where the patient will present with um, extensive vaginal bleeding. And what you'll see is a gestational sac in the cervical region. And usually the chief differential consideration here is that of, well, am I looking at a gestational sac that's implanted in the cervix, i.e. a cervical ectopic, or is it just the cervical phase of a uterine abortion? Was the gestational sac normally located, and now uh, this is a failed pregnancy and the gestational sac is on the way out, and I just happen to be imaging it when it's down in the cervix. And one clue that you can use is that if you see the sac in the cervix and there is an embryo within it, and there, it's a live embryo with fetal cardiac activity, it's much more likely to be a cervical ectopic because if this were a spontaneous abortion in progress, you would not expect to see uh, fetal, uh, a viable fetus and, and fetal cardiac activity. So here's an example of a uh, gestational sac which has implanted in the cervix. You can see here's the endometrial cavity up here. The cervix is here, and we can see there's a yolk sac and a small fetal pole. This is a patient who presented a lot later with her cervical ectopic, and you can clearly see that this gestational sac is uh, located uh, much lower than it should be in the endometrial canal up here, and this is consistent with the cervical ectopic. A corneal ectopic, which occurs in the cornu of the uterus or the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube, will appear sonographically as an eccentrically located gestational sac. And the key finding here also is that there is an asymmetric or incomplete mantle or rim of myometrium. Um, the pregnancy will, will be separate from a decidualized uterine cavity. Now, sometimes we get into a, sort of a difficult situation because we're not sure, is the gestational 
cornual sac truly eccentrically located and should I worry about a corneal ectopic or is it just uh, deformed somewhat because the patient is having a uterine contraction or maybe it's displaced somewhat because there's a fibroid. And if you're thinking it might be a uterine contraction, you can certainly just have the patient wait and rescan her in a half hour or so and see if um, that appearance sort of resolves. The other thing that you have to think about, well, maybe the sac is eccentric in location because we're dealing with a patient with a congenital anomaly of the uterus, such as a bicornuate or a septate uterus. Here's an example of a corneal ectopic where now we can see the gestational sac. It has a fetal pole within it, and I think you can appreciate that there is clearly no myometrium surrounding the majority of this sac. It looks like it's uh, just about to break out of the uterus here, and here we see the separate decidualized endometrium, and this appearance is referred to as the so-called interstitial line sign. Here's another example of a corneal ectopic. So here's the uterus over here, and here's the gestational sac with the fetal pole, and uh, this patient went to laparoscopy, and it shows you the laparoscopic correlate. Another example of a corneal ectopic, and this was actually a corneal twin gestation. So we see one uh, gestational sac here and the other one here. One sac was smaller than the other, but there were two sacs. And once again, you can see that there is no surrounding myometrium here covering majority of these sacs. And if you put on your power Doppler, it shows you how vascular this structure is. So you can see that if this were to go on to rupture, this would certainly be a life-threatening situation. Now, on the other hand, here's a patient with a bicornuate uterus, and so we see that the gestational sac is off to one side, but we can also appreciate that there's a separate or endometrial cavity here, so there's a separation here consistent with a bicornuate uterus, and when we scan through this in the transverse and sagittal plane, we see that although it is over on the left side of the uterus, it is surrounded by an intact rim of myometrium. Here's a patient with a septate uterus, and again, division of the endometrial canal. There's a pregnancy on one side, and again, it is surrounded by an intact rim of myometrium. Now here's an example of, pa of a patient who had a heterotopic pregnancy, which means that she had a pregnancy both within the uterus and outside of the uterus, and the pregnancy that was outside of the uterus was a twin pregnancy, and it was located in the abdomen. So this was a very unusual situation that actually occurred spontaneously. She was not undergoing assisted reproduction. So here we have the pregnancy that's inside of the uterus. We see the gestational sac, the fetal pole, and the yolk sac. And then as we scanned her, we saw that there was some fluid down in the cul-de-sac outside of the uterus. And as we interrogated this more closely, we saw that there were actually two yolk sacs down here in the cul-de-sac associated with two separate fetal poles. So very unusual situation. Now, another uh, phenomenon that can occur is that there may actually be implantation of a gestational sac within a C-section scar. And this is considered to be a rare type of an ectopic pregnancy, and it is an ectopic pregnancy because the pregnancy is not uh, located where it should be. And basically what happens is that the scar, which is usually in the anterior lower uterine segment, never sort of heals completely, and there is a tract or potential space that persists, and then um, the gestational sac can implant in that space. And the problem is, is that as the pregnancy grows, um, there will no longer be a complete rim of of myometrium surrounding this uh, gestational sac, and there's a very high risk of uterine rupture and uncontrollable hemorrhage. Um, also, if you recognize this, um, a DNC is considered contraindicated because of the increased risk of uterine perforation in that setting. So management will generally uh, consist of either local injection of various agents such as potassium chloride or methotrexate, systemic methotrexate, or many people favor laparoscopy because you can repair the defect in the uterus at that time so that this situation doesn't happen again. So here's an example of a gestational sac implantation in a C-section scar, and we can recognize this because here we have the endometrial canal. It looks like the gestational sac is outside of the endometrial canal. You can appreciate this linear hypochoic area here, which represents the scar, and the sac is located within the scar. Now, when we imaged this patient, she was about five weeks along. There was a gestational sac. Um, her beta level was fairly low. We didn't see a fetal pole, so the clinicians decided to watch her 
carefully and thought that this might resolve on, on its own. She came back a week later, and unfortunately, the sac had uh, grown, and now we see a fetal pole within it. So at this point, she was treated surgically. Which brings me to a brief discussion of treatment options with respect to ectopic pregnancy. Now, traditionally, the treatment has been surgical, consisting of laparoscopic salpingostomy, but you can also uh, treat patients medically, either using systemic methotrexate or local injections, as I just mentioned. Um, but there also may be a role for conservative or expectant management, because up to 24 percent of ectopic pregnancies may actually resolve spontaneously. And Dr. Atri and colleagues published this article in AJR in 2001, and what they attempted to do was uh, to identify predictors of spontaneous resolution of an ectopic pregnancy. So if you, if you see certain findings, can you suggest that maybe the patient can just be watched carefully because it might resolve? And the findings that they uh, described were if the beta level is low, if it's less than 1,000, or if you document rapidly decreasing beta levels, if you don't see a gestational sac, if there's a longer time interval from the time of, between the time of imaging and the last menstrual period, if you see an adnexal mass but it demonstrates a high resistive index, not a low resistive index, or if you document decreasing size of the adnexal mass on follow-up sonography. Now, if the patient is going to be treated and um, the um, decision is going to be made as to whether to use systemic methotrexate or not uh, versus surgery, for instance, there are certain inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria that you, uh, that clinicians will use to make this um, decision. And some of this impacts on what we see at sonography. So obviously, for a patient to be treated with systemic methotrexate, she has to be hemodynamically stable because any unstable patient is going to be taken to the OR. But if we see an ectopic, um, if it is less than three and a half centimeters in size, and also if there is no cardiac activity demonstrated, so it is not a live ectopic, then those patients are good candidates for systemic treatment. On the other hand, if um, you see that there is a live ectopic or if it's a very large adnexal mass, those patients don't tend to do as well with systemic treatment and may benefit uh, more from surgery. In terms of systemic methotrexate, it uh, has a reported overall success rate of 64 to 94 percent. Three percent of patients will require a second dose, and basically the obstetrician gynecologists follow these patients, and they follow their beta levels until they drop uh, below a certain level. If it plateaus before it reaches this level, they will give a second dose. And in most cases, it's been shown to be as equally effective as surgery if you use those inclusion criteria. And this was a paper that found that the overall efficacy, intrauterine pregnancy rate, and recurrent ectopic rate after methotrexate were comparable to those after laparoscopic salpingostomy. Well, if a patient is treated with systemic methotrexate, should she be followed with routine uh, ultrasound? And the answer to that question is no. And it's been shown in a couple of studies that a tubal ectopic may actually increase in size and become more vascular, even though the patient is responding to the systemic methotrexate, or um, there may be no correlation between the beta HCG level resolution and the sonographic resolution. So uh, we tend not to recommend routine ultrasound follow-up and reserve follow-up ultrasound for patients who present again with uh, pelvic pain or increased bleeding. I'm not going to say a lot about local therapies other than that a number of groups have shown that you can successfully treat ectopic pregnancies uh, with either ultrasound or laparoscopically guided injection of various agents such as methotrexate or KCL, and those have been used to successfully treat cervical or corneal ectopics. Can we predict tubal rupture? So um, patients who come in and they have an ectopic, and um, can we tell the clinician whether or not we think the uh, ectopic has already ruptured? Well, if you see a large amount of free fluid, also if it's complex fluid with echoes, these are suggestive findings, but you can also see that in patients who have not yet ruptured. So uh, many times it really uh, becomes a clinical assessment. No sonographic finding is, is entirely sensitive or specific in terms of predicting tubal rupture.
The last topic I'd like to talk about is that of the corpus luteal cyst. And um, this was a paper published in 99, and basically they had a series of patients in whom they evaluated the corpus luteum cyst. And they found in their series that actually in 2% of their patients who went on to have normal pregnancies, they did not visualize a corpus luteal cyst. But of course, we will see a cyst in most patients who present uh, for ultrasound in the first trimester. The corpus luteum has a varied appearance. It may be round and iso to hypoechoic and can be a thick-walled cyst with an anechoic center, contain debris, septation, or it can be a, a simple-appearing thin-walled cyst. There will be circumferential flow in the wall with color Doppler, and in their series, the mean resistive index of 0 0.49 was demonstrated. So here's an example of a patient in first trimester of pregnancy, we see this hypochoic area within the ovary. Um, and sometimes this can be difficult to visualize, but if you put on your color Doppler, you see that there is flow within the wall of the structure, which is consistent with a hemorrhagic corpus luteum. Now, sometimes it is difficult to differentiate a corpus luteum cyst versus a tubal ring. And the most um, important finding that you need to make or observation that you need to make is that if the structure is located within the ovary, it is much more likely to be just a normal corpus luteum cyst and not a tubal ring related to an ectopic. Um, and that's because, yes, intraovarian ectopics occur, but they're very, very rare. Um, and sometimes it's difficult and it's a challenge because the corpus luteum can actually be somewhat exophytic. And it may be difficult to decide, is it inside of the ovary and likely a normal corpus luteum, or is it outside of the ovary and thereby much more worrisome for an ectopic? And one maneuver that you can perform is to exert a little gentle pressure with the transvaginal probe and with your non-scanning -scan hand, put some pressure on the maternal abdomen, and you can see whether or not it looks like the structure is moving either with the ovary or away from the ovary. That's the so-called sliding organ sign. So if it's moving with the ovary, then it's much more likely to be an intraovarian cyst, such as a corpus luteum. But if you're still not sure, uh, this group looked at, well, can we tell or differentiate between these two structures by looking at their echogenicity? And they found that 88% of tubal rings were more echogenic than the ovary, whereas only a small percentage, 7% of corpus luteum cysts, were more echogenic than the ovary. So their conclusion was that the echogenicity of an adnexal mass can help to distinguish the tubal ring of an ectopic pregnancy from a corpus luteum. So once again, here we have our hemorrhagic corpus luteum here, and I show that next to a tubal ring, and you can see that the tubal ring is, in fact, more echogenic than the corpus luteum. And here's a patient that we're evaluating for the presence of an ectopic pregnancy. We have the uterus over here. We're looking in the right adnexa, and we see two structures here. One is sort of a rounded ring-like structure, which is very hyperechoic, and the other one is over here, and it's somewhat more hypoechoic. And so based on what I just told told you, we would conclude that this structure here is the hemorrhagic corpus luteum, whereas this structure over here was a tubal ring, and that was confirmed at laparoscopy. So in summary then, I would just like to summarize the role of ultrasound in the first trimester pregnancy. Of course, one of the most important applications is to confirm that there is an IUP present and that it is viable. This is the most accurate time to assess uh, fetal age and also fetal number. Ultrasound can be very helpful to diagnose a failed early pregnancy and also identify pregnancies that are at risk and that need to be followed closely. And then lastly, ultrasound plays a very important role in the diagnosis and in guiding the management of ectopic pregnancy. Thank you for your attention.